I'm excited uh, to roll out this uh, bell schedule for you this evening so you can uh, take a look at what the opportunities exist for our students moving down, uh, down the road. If you are familiar, our Board of Education uh, established a strategic plan and uh, has put that in place. And there are some components of the strategic plan that are impacted directly by the high school bell schedule. So, so when, when we, we start, start looking, looking at, at what, what those strategic plan goals or objectives are, we're so looking at increasing the number of students participating in AP courses. Uh, those are our most highly rigorous courses that we offer. Uh, they also present out opportunities for our students to earn college credit uh, across the state of our Arkansas. Uh, student success plan engagement. Uh, if you haven't heard about the student success plan, there's actually a state of Arkansas requirement now that all of our students beginning with our current ninth graders engage in what is called a student success plan that addresses a variety of different facets, including enrichment opportunities, uh, developing a four-year plan, social emotional learning, college career life readiness. And so making sure that they, our, our students engage with that student success plan is a priority, and that requires us to schedule time in order for them to do that. We're also looking at the on-track graduation rate. Uh, many people don't know how the actual graduation rate works, uh, the cohort model, uh, so I'm gonna give you a Reader's Digest version of it, but when a student enters ninth grade, their clock starts. They have four years to complete the required curriculum in order to graduate. If they take any longer than that, they count against us. And so one of the things that we have to look at also is we have students who receive special education services who may require that they attend high school a little bit longer, and even if they do, they still count against us. And so, while we would love to have a 100% graduation rate, it's really difficult to do that. So, our current graduation rate is at around 90 to 91%, and that's always a year behind, so that was based off of last year. And so, we have some growth opportunities, but when we start talking about that 5% of kids, we need to make sure that we're doing some things and providing some opportunities to help those kids reach the finish line, which is the high school graduation. And so that is a scheduling opportunity for us. We need to improve the schedule accuracy rate. This is just a fancy way of saying we need to make sure and provide opportunities to get all of our kids enrolled into the courses that they actually select through the CAP process. Right now, that's a little difficult because under our current AB schedule, we have four classes on an A day and only three academic classes on a B day. We'll talk a little bit uh, more about that uh, as we get into the presentation, but we need to improve the accuracy of getting kids into the courses that they request. We also need to decrease the number of schedule changes, and we do that by making sure that we have plenty of opportunities and that our kids are getting opportunities to sign up for the classes that they want and take the classes that they want. And then finally, we need to increase, increase internship opportunities. Uh, we're at a time now where we need to help prepare our, specifically our upperclassmen, our, our seniors, to transition from high school to post-secondary life. And so we need to be able to help them discover what some of those things uh, that they might be interested in. And we'd like to do that in high school when it's free, as opposed to them getting to college and having to pay for courses that they may have had an opportunity to explore in high school. And so one of the ways we can do that is through providing internship opportunities. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the presentation as well. So we listen. Uh, we collect a, a lot of feedback, a lot of feedback. And uh, we, we have that in, in terms of student uh, feedback. We have that in terms of parent feedback. And we also engage our teachers in this process. So uh, last, the second half of last semester, of last, last year, we uh, assembled a group of 21, 21 teachers. teachers. We got, we got together, together and uh, we, we looked, looked at, at uh, a SWOT, SWOT analysis. analysis. We, we created, created what, are what are the strengths, strengths weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of our existing uh, bell schedule that we offer. And so we wrestled around with that and tried to identify some, some priorities. And then, uh, you know, we looked at different scheduling models to try to figure out what would work best for us. And here's the difficulty in when you bring a lot of people together on this. A lot of people have some very strong feelings about particular bell schedules. 
because they may have gone to school with a certain bell schedule. They may not know about a certain other bell schedule. And they're going to, they're going to insert that into the conversation. And so we set a threshold. We weren't going to do a vote. We were going to try to build consensus on what we could live with. And we set the threshold at 75%. And if you know a lot of teachers, if you can get 75% of teachers to agree on something that this is good, it's, you're moving in the right direction. And so we were able to develop consensus on what we're going to present to you. And so I want to point out and, and recognize uh, the folks who were on our Bell Scheduling Committee. They represented a wide variety of departments. Uh, they had all very outstanding educators who have a heart for kids and really want uh, to provide the best opportunities. And so I felt that it was important to at least show you who participated on this Bell Scheduling Committee and was involved in the decision-making process. Uh, we also had a separate group of teachers who worked on the advisory structure, uh, which is a little bit of a, a portion of this presentation, but um, we had an another group of about 20 teachers who were, who were part of that uh, decision-making process. So I want to go over some student feedback with you. Um, we administered a survey last year. Uh, now granted, these were not open-ended questions. I'll be upfront with you, they're not open-ended questions. They were more of, uh, you know, uh, select what your interests are. And so I want to talk about those as they pertain to how they eventually arrived at the decision that we made. So we'll focus first on students. Uh, First of all, we had 998 responses, which is a little bit over a third of our student population, which is a really good number when we're issuing surveys to high school students. Sometimes they don't read their emails. Sometimes they just think the survey doesn't apply to them. So anytime we're able to get that high of a rate, we're feeling pretty good. But as you can see on this one, how many courses per day seem reasonable for students to manage their homework, study for tests, et cetera? You're going to notice that the largest portion of that pie is three to four. When you start getting into three to four, you're looking at a block schedule. If you start getting into five to six or seven to eight, you're looking at a more traditional schedule. That, that's courses per day. And so right here, you can see that our students are preferring that three to four. I'm going to stop and talk a little bit about this just to kind of uh, gauge or to, to give you a little understanding of where we're at. Fayetteville Public Schools requires students to earn 24 credits to graduate from high school. There are examples of block schedules out there that are three blocks on one day and three blocks on another day. But when you look at that in totality, that means that they could earn six total credits over the course of a year times four years is 24. That means if a kid messes up one time, they're already behind in graduation or being on track to graduate. So, you really can't build a three block schedule. You have to look at the next one, which would be four. So I just wanted to give you some background information so when you see what we're gonna present later on, you, you understand where we're coming from. Again, this is from student. What type of schedule would you prefer to have? Students would like, uh, prefer to have fewer classes uh, per day, but longer periods. So again, it's gearing more towards a block schedule. Uh, you know, we do have a, a segment of our student population that wanted more classes per day, but shorter periods, but the overwhelming 82% uh, were looking at fewer classes but longer periods. How important is it to you that you see your teacher every day? All right, in a traditional schedule, you're going to see your, your class teacher every single day uh, on the dot. For our students, between the somewhat important and not important, most of our kids have adapted to an AB block schedule where they don't necessarily see their teacher on a daily basis, so that might explain why you're seeing some of the results here. Uh, but it's, it, it's important, but maybe it's not as important as some other things. Does a schedule that allows some flexibility when, uh, when the school day starts or ends interest you? This is more of a reference to our current zero hour practice where our kids can come in at 7.15, they can be released at 2.15. There seems to be a lot of uh, acceptance for a different, uh, a flexible start and end time. Advisory. And advisory, we'll talk a lot about that. Advisory is divided up into two categories. You have uh, your EDGE, which is your uh, Educate, Development, Grow, and Empower, where we talk about social, emotional learning, college, career, life, readiness skills, and academic advising. And then you have the other component, which is Academics and Enrichment, or A&E, which is where kids can get involved in clubs and organizations, but also receive help. 
But when we start talking about advisory, currently addresses college career readiness, social emotional learning, and academic advising adequately, you'll see that most of our kids feel that it is. And I'd like you to just remember this when we go over the parent feedback because this is one of the ones that is starkly different from what our parents feel about advisory. So if you just kind of take a mental snapshot of that. It's important to you that students have credit recovery options during the school day. We have students at Fayetteville High School who may fall behind and may mess up and they need opportunities to recover that credit so they can get back on track and still graduate on time and our students feel that way as well. They needed to have an opportunity to stay on track to graduate. And then would you support a daily bell schedule that would allow seniors in high school to have opportunities to leave campus for internships and early college opportunities? And we're talking about kids and if you give them the opportunity to leave campus, they're gonna be like, heck yes, that's what I wanna do. So. Obviously, you can see that there's uh, there's a there's a lot of that's a, the very popular uh, that they would like that opportunity to leave campus, and so it's taking our teacher feedback in that uh, bell schedule committee group, taking our student feedback, and then finally putting it in with our parent feedback, and so same questions from our parents: what type of bell schedule or how many courses per day seem reasonable for students to manage, uh, do homework, study for tests, that sort of thing. You're, you're seeing a very similar response to what our students say that three to four is where they would like to see it. Which type of schedule would you prefer for your child? Again, very similar to what you saw with the students. They'd like fewer classes per day, but longer periods, which again indicates more leaning towards a block schedule. How important is it to you that your child see your teachers every day? This is a little bit different, but it's still pretty similar in that it's not necessarily the highest priority, but it'd be nice. And so, uh, and I, again, I think that might be because our parents are also acclimated to an A-B block schedule where they, where they know their kids don't see a teacher every single day. And so that might explain some of what we're seeing here in terms of the results. Parents, does a schedule that allows some flexibility when the school day starts or ends interest you? Again, this is matching up with exactly what the students were saying as well. Like, yes, we need some flexibility because it may impact our family a little bit differently. Remember, I asked you to take the mental snapshot of advisory. So from this one, advisory at FHS currently addresses college career readiness, social emotional learning, and academic advising adequately. So the students said, yes, it does. I mean, there was, there was a clear majority here. Here you can see it's kind of broken down in thirds. And so one of, the, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, how do we build a schedule and, and, and ensure that we are providing those skills to our students during the school day? And so there, there's a big discrepancy between what the students and the parents thought in this particular area. Is it important to you that students have credit recovery options during the school day? Parents, again, agreed. Yes, this is good. And I should point out, there were 413 responses to this survey, which I know seems low in a school this size, but I can assure you that getting 413 parent responses to a survey is actually a really good turnout for, in, in, in my experience as, as a high school principal. Uh, but going back to this, that credit recovery options are an important part of building a schedule. Maybe, I missed one. Okay, so the last one is, uh, would, you support, or, uh, would you support a daily bell schedule that would allow seniors in high school to have opportunities to leave campus for internships or early college? And yes, parents want that kind of support as well because from what I've heard from a lot of parents is, we need to help them transition from high school into whatever that next step is going to be. And so we need to provide opportunities to do so. And so what is all of this saying? It's, it's saying that we've got some work that we need to do. Uh, there's student faculty and uh, parent support uh, to keep a block schedule going forward, okay? There's a desire for flexible start and end times. There needs to be an intentional focus on college career, life readiness, social emotional learning. 
Uh, and we need to reimagine the senior year so students can transition to post-secondary opportunities. So we take all of that data, we put it together, and we're trying to figure out, okay, what are our, what are our options? So before we actually go into what that option is, I also want to share with you my 18 month my 18 month journey as high school principal and some of the concerns that I've heard from parents when I'm talking with them here at school or when I'm out in the community and they're asking questions about Fayetteville High School. And so I want I want you to see if any of these resonate with you. My child and I get confused on what day it is. Is it an A or a B day? Which backpack do I need to bring to school? Because I've got my A-Day books here and i got my B-Day books here. I, I can't remember. That, that's confusing. My child has so many things going on outside of school and doesn't have the opportunity to visit with teachers during the day to assist with homework. My senior needs to earn money so they can save up for college tuition instead of taking classes that really aren't relevant to them. Because under our current structure, seniors are required to have a full schedule. And so they may have all the credits they need, but they're expected to sign up for classes to fill their schedule out. Then we look at things like, my child tells me they don't have a connection with their advisor and they don't understand the importance. Uh, I'm not one to uh, you know, paint a, a rosier picture than, than what is actually there. Fayetteville High School is a large high school. We're at about 2,700 students. It's tough. It's tough to create such a, uh, to create a personalized environment with connection with an individual kid in such, an, uh, such a large environment. But it's important to be able to break that down, and this is why advisory is so important. It's important to break that down so that we can have advisory teams of about 18 to 22 kids that know your child better than any other adult in the school. So that if your child is having a problem at school, if they don't feel comfortable coming to an administrator or they don't necessarily feel comfortable coming to a counselor, that they know that they have that one adult who cares for them. And so this is, this is a struggle. This is a struggle that some of our kids go through and some of our parents go through. My child would like to take more AP and CTE courses, but there isn't enough room in their schedule. It's a reality. And what makes it even tougher is some of our most highly rigorous courses in our AP courses are only offered one time in the day. And it might be like, for example, I'll, I'll use a perfect example. If your child wants to take AP Spanish and the best way to get as many kids into that AP Spanish class is first block on A days, that's where we're going to place it. But what if your kid is also in band? That happens at first block as well. And so now your child is left having to make a choice between band, something that they love, or AP Spanish. And so as a school, we need to remove those barriers and try to come up with innovative ways to make sure that we can avoid having to make difficult choices. Inevitably, there are going to be some choices that have to be made, but we need to break that, break that down a little bit further. And then, of course, my child struggled with their grades during the freshman and sophomore year, and they can't get back on track. So under our current graduation, our uh, Fayetteville Public Schools graduation requirements, you need 24 credits to graduate. Under our current schedule, there's seven blocks over the course of a day. So you can earn seven credits in a year times four. You can earn up to 28 total credits. You need 24 to graduate you can get 28 if under our current schedule. The new schedule we're looking at, there's actually eight blocks times four, 32. You're building more opportunities for our kids who may have had a rough freshman and sophomore year to get back on track. It's very important that we look to those kids because again, one of our strategic goal objectives is to increase the on-time graduation rate. And so how do we address all of those past concerns and address the data that we've collected. We need to develop a schedule that provides consistency for students, parents, and teachers, something that's easy to follow. We need to provide multiple opportunities for uh, each week for students to meet with their teachers for assistance 
and we need to provide flexibility that allows students to recover credit if they struggle or hit a bump in the road. Sounds really easy, right? Not. It's difficult, and we had some really hard conversations about it. We also needed to uh, provide a consistent and intentional effort at delivering, delivering college and career and life readiness as well as social emotional learning to our students. We need to be able to provide more opportunities for students to engage with courses they are interested in learning about. One of the things that I feel very, very strongly about is I want kids to be able to explore things while, they're, while, while it's free so that when they go to college, they're not exploring while they're in college. That can get really expensive. I'll use a perfect example. My daughter, who's a junior in high school, when she came in as a freshman, she, she knew she was going to be a nurse. She knew she was going to be a nurse. And then her dad made her watch this movie called Whitewater Summer with Kevin Bacon. And in the movie, if you're not familiar with it, Kevin Bacon falls over a cliff and has a compound fracture, and they actually show it. And my daughter right then, oh, no. She, I, I don't want to be a nurse, and now i got to go talk to my teacher because I had developed this plan that this is what I wanted to do. I'm so glad that my daughter figured that out as a freshman in high school rather than as a sophomore in college in nursing school. We want our kids to help have opportunities not only to find their passions, but maybe also rule some things out. And then, of course, we've got a long history of excellence at Fayetteville High School. And so how do we do all of this while maintaining the excellence that we have experienced? And so here is a breakdown of the Bell schedule. And I, I did this without the times in there so you can kind of see how it looks. The biggest change, obviously, is when you look at that B day. Under our current one, we would have two blocks, then we would have what was the seventh period advisory, and then you'd also have then you'd have your eighth block. What we liked about this as a committee was it guarantees three student contacts per week with an A day and a B day, and then you can meet in all of your classes on a C day. If you're wondering why the numbers are maybe evens on the A day and or sorry, odds on the A day and evens on the B day, it's so that we could make the C day work in order. So that's why you have 0A1357 and then 0B2468. So then we can order them. You still have your morning and your afternoon. All right. And we'll we'll come back to this when you when we when we see a little bit more detailed version. Also want to point out the advisory structure. This, now, this was a rumor that uh, was going around a long, uh, long time last year uh, when we started talking about the Bell schedule. Many of our students thought that we were getting rid of advisory or A&E altogether, and that, and that wasn't the case. That was never part of the discussion. So if you look at the schedule, that advisory, which is in between the first two blocks of the day, that's a 30-minute time period, and this is the structure of it. So... There is one day of EDGE, which is the uh, Educate, Grow, Develop, and Empower, where we're going to cover our college career uh, life readiness skills as well as social emotional learning skills. So uh, if your student has come home and talked to you about Navient's tasks and that sort of thing, that's how we are incorporating uh, that, that curriculum into a setting where, where students can actually make sure that they get that. That is also the basic foundation of the student success plan, which again is one of our, our Board of Education objectives, making sure that our students engage with it. So that would take place on Monday. Also on Monday, students would look at the remainder of their week and find out where they, if they have clubs or if they need to go and visit with a teacher, they'll actually sign up for those in advance. So they're going to have to practice some time management and some planning to be able to say, you know what, on Tuesday I want to go here, on Wednesday I want to go here, on Thursday I want to go here. And so how that would work then is we have a system where they can sign up and request all of that. But then when Tuesday comes around, they're not going to report to their advisory classroom. They're just going to go directly to the classroom that they signed up for. And if they don't have a place to go, they will stay in their edge classroom with their advisor and it can turn into a study hall if they would like. So that's kind of a built-in 30 minutes across the board. This takes place Monday through Thursday. Here's the kicker. If we ever have a week where, we ha where it's shortened, we are always going to have an edge day. So like Martin Luther King Day, for example, is on a Monday. Well, we're not in school. That means that Tuesday, even though it says that it's A&E, is actually going to be an edge day. And then we would go 
A, uh, then we would do the A and E's after that. So we're always going to have an edge day, and we would adjust on the, the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday activities. So by doing this, students will have three days a week meet with teachers uh, for assistance, make up tests, be involved in clubs, and teachers are going, because we are moving from what was a 45-minute A and E session where uh, students could get help from teachers, uh, it's moving it to a 30 minute. So that is going to require our teachers to adjust. So maybe they uh, don't give an entire assessment. Maybe they break the assessment down in two and the student takes two of those time periods to make up a test. But we'll have to work through that with each individual teacher. I also wanted to throw this up here because I think it's important that you see how this actually cleans up. So on March uh, this year, this is what our monthly AB schedule is going to look like. So this is where that parent concern of what day is it? What week is it? Is it an A or a B day? They don't know. I mean, it's, it's tough. But then you transition to our new schedule for next year. Our bell schedule committee said we need to make it simple. So we want B days always to be on Tuesday, Thursdays. So nobody has to guess. B days are always going to be on Tuesdays, Thursdays. And then your A days fill in, and then your C day is on Friday. If we have a shortened week like Martin Luther King week where it's on a Monday, it will actually go B-A, B-A. We'll, we'll drop the C day off. So that C day is the flex one that we can move. But you can notice just by looking at this, you don't have to guess on what day of the week it's going to be. Our kids don't, our parents don't. It's cleaner that way, okay? Then you get to the actual schedule itself, and so you can see the times built in there. Uh, a couple things that I want to point out on this. Again, on the B days, we're actually building in another academic class. So there's four classes on A days, there's four classes on B days. And then everybody has an advisory for 30 minutes. You will also notice on the schedule that lunch is actually a lunch now. If I got high school students in the room who have first lunch, it's sometimes a brunch. It starts at 1020 right now. That's a really early lunch. This actually pushes it back to 1050 uh, so that it's, it, it actually fits within that, that lunch time period. And then, of course, you have your C day where you are going straight through. Those are about 45-minute classes. Uh, the fourth block or fourth time period on the C day is a little bit longer, uh, but the Bell Schedule Committee felt that uh, the extra time in there actually counteracted some of the bells because there's a lot of bells to dismiss kids for lunches during that time. And they also said that we would love to show our Bulldog Weekly uh, television show, which runs about anywhere from 10 to 12 minutes during that time as part of uh, that fourth block on that day. So that's how that uh, Friday C day would look. And so nuts and bolts of all of this is that we're providing a consistent AB schedule with a flex day. B days will always be on Tuesday and Thursdays unless a holiday or non-school day takes, uh, or non, yeah, excuse me, a non-school day takes precedence. So we would adjust. The C day could uh, go off. If we happen to have a snow day, we can adjust there as well. Um, obviously, that would, uh, that would get communicated uh, as part of my regular communication with parents. Guarantees three, students con three student contacts a week. Under the current schedule, students may have two contacts one week and three the next, and then alternate. At least with this one, you have three student contacts per week. Provides for 90 minutes a week of A&E time and 30 minutes of EDGE to focus on college career life readiness. Uh, social emotional learning, which is a part of our counseling curriculum, and engage in the student success plan. It also allows our students the opportunity to see their see multiple teachers. Under the current model, because it's every other day, our students may get to see a teacher twice one week or three times the next. At least now we're kind of uh, being consistent by saying there are going to be three times a week that you're going to be able to see a teacher if you need that assistance. We also develop credit recovery options uh, for students who fall behind. If you fall behind early, we can catch you up and still help you graduate on time. So that if you stumble during that freshman year, we'll pick you up. If you stumble during that sophomore year, we're going to pick you up. We're going to help get you towards the finish line. Because high school is difficult for some of our students. And we need to make sure that we've got those layers built in to support them when they need it. And speaking of layers, 
it's not just our struggling kids. We also need to provide opportunities for our students who have found a lot of success, who have got, who've passed all their classes, and maybe they don't need to be at the physical site all the time. And so presenting this option of the senior year opportunities when we start talking about uh, jobs for Arkansas graduates. That's a course that we already have. First of all, you can sign up for that, you can earn credit, but then you would take your classes in the morning, and then in the afternoon, you could leave campus to work that job that you have, because it's a credit-bearing course. And we have a teacher who supervises that experience. We also have an internship option. So the internship option is you, maybe you want to explore a potential career down the road, or maybe you want to job shadow a few places. Giving kids opportunities to leave campus and actually experience it to find out, yeah, you know what, I might be interested in looking at this a little bit further. And then option number three is students who sign up for concurrent courses or face-to-face uh, -face college courses. You know, for example, we've got the new Springdale NWAC campus. Maybe they want to go take a college course there to build in the flexibility so they could actually go and attend that. Going back to what we had talked about at the very beginning, right now we expect kids to sign up for a full schedule. Some of them will come back and say, I really don't need these courses. And so when we started talking about this whole bell schedule thing and trying to figure out how it's going to work, the question was not what, can, what parameters can we as a school put in place, but what can we take away to allow you to make informed decisions with your child about their educational future. Instead of us saying you have to sign up for a full schedule, I'd rather have to be, the, you say, I want my kid to take another AP course. Great, go ahead. My kid really doesn't need to be there. I need them to go have a job. Great, we've got a pathway for you. I want my kid to go take a college course. Awesome, we got you covered. So building flexibility that is allowing you to make those important decisions based on what your post-secondary opportunities are is very powerful and that's what we accomplish in this schedule. And so with that, uh, I hope if you have questions, again, I'll just uh, reiterate, if you have a smart device, you can uh, type them in and put them on that, uh, that website. Uh, if you don't have a smart device, my administrative team members are back there. They've got note cards. Just raise your hand. They can uh, put those and type, uh, collect them from you and type them in for you. And so I'm going to go ahead and minimize this and go to the actual questions themselves. not appear that there were any questions coming through, so I'll give you some time. Uh, you know, I think we're also a small enough group also that uh, I don't think we necessarily need to do that. So if you have a question, yes. Oh my goodness, okay. It might help if I change it to anyone, so I apologize. So if you wanna go back to that, you can go ahead and type your questions in. I'll give you a few minutes to put those in there and then I'll, I'll put them up. Did that work? Okay. What's that? Oh, yes, go ahead. Great question. So if you didn't hear uh, the question, just to make sure I have it, uh, would students be able to sign up to visit with their teachers other than Monday? We're going to make that part of the time because we want them to plan out the rest of their week. However, the way our system works up, you can actually sign up that day as well. But we want to make it part of their planning process to look ahead, use their time appropriately, and plan accordingly. But great question. Yes, because it, uh, it, is, a, it is a website that we call Primetime. And with their Chromebooks, they can actually log in and request to visit with a teacher as well. Yeah. 
yeah, that's uh, the the question was would they potentially be able to visit with more than t one teacher during that time? Uh, we struggle with that because we sometimes have students go where they're not supposed to go and don't necessarily follow uh, the outlines that we have. So we are looking as a staff and putting mechanisms in place to ensure that our kids are in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Uh, if our students can demonstrate over time that they are going to uh, up live by those expectations, then yes, we can explore different opportunities to allow them to see multiple teachers at a time. They do have that ability right now if they get a pass written by the teacher, but we, we, we also would like to streamline that as well. All right, I'm gonna go back to the question. How does this new schedule impact athletes? That's a great question. Uh, so, on the, the actual bell schedule uh, itself, we are still on that AB schedule. So, there's still going to be that, uh, that morning practice time and also the athletic period as well. So, on the AB days, not going to be much of an issue. When you get to Friday, uh, that's why it was important to do odd and even days so that we could have the 0A and 0B together as well as the 7 and 8 so that we could, uh, we could make sure that those athletic periods are still intact. Uh, but the other part of this too is the reason why that flex day on fr is on Friday. Friday has the least amount of impact on athletics as the other days because Fridays are typically your competition days. And so there are fewer practices during that time. So uh, we're going to see, I mean, you're going to see some type of impact, but we tried to minimize that as much as possible. And we did have representatives from the athletic department as part of the bell schedule committee and they they vetted that and said, yes, this, this will work. Will the kids have to carry their books for all eight classes on Friday? You know what? I, I had that. I gave this presentation to our uh, PTSO today, and I got that exact same question. I got that question uh, also about, you know, looking down the road, are we still going to have uh, these big, heavy books that kids need to, uh, to lug around? And the answer is, and I, I hope that it's not... Uh, terribly unsatisfying for you is we'll have to wait and see because our teachers go through a curriculum revision process to determine what type of materials that they are going to going to use. You know, as a former English teacher, I remember my kids having those big anthologies that weighed about 25 pounds that you carried around. But I also, I, I didn't necessarily want them to have that, but I, I did want them to be able to do some online, but then I realized that some kids don't necessarily like reading online. So we have to, as we go through the curriculum revision process, our teachers are gonna have to make decisions about that. That being said, many of our classrooms, many of our classrooms have classroom sets of textbooks so that students may potentially have a copy at home but they also have a copy at school that they could use. So I think it really depends on each individual student and what classes they're in that will determine how much they're actually going to have to carry around with them. If you take 0A but not 0B, what do you do during the 0B time on Friday? It's a great question. Uh, so if you were to, if you look at the handout on the 0A, 0B, uh, I think something that is kind of a, that, that not a lot of people know is we have buses arrive at Fayetteville High School between, oh, I want to say 7.45 and 8 o'clock on a daily basis. And so we have a bunch of kids already at school between 8 and 8.50, and they spend that time in the cafeteria. And many of them are doing homework or uh, they are just chatting with their friends. And so when we start talking about those students who may have that zero B time on Friday, the, the easy answer is we already have kids that are on campus, so they would go to the cafeteria much like uh, the rest of our students. But we also, that's also an opportunity for us as well that we could look at how might we be able to provide some intervention time for students who may need to visit with a teacher or something like that. We need to work out the details of that. But the, the short answer to that question is that They'll go to the cafeteria during that time. Next question on there is, let's talk about lockers. I already have a kid not wanting to drag a coat around school. C-Days have four extra notebooks to bring. Uh, I, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Um, I was not here when uh, the building was built, and I don't understand what the conversation was about lockers at the time. 
uh, but it is a, it's, it's, it's a current reality that we have, that we don't have lockers. Uh, I do know that one of the issues that uh, gets solved under our current schedule is we have kids who have two different backpacks. They have an A-day backpack and they have a B-day backpack. Um, the Friday component, I don't have an answer for you. I, I, I wish I did. I wish I could say that, yeah, it's really easy. You just do this. Um, the answer is I, I don't know. Um, and again, I, I know that's terribly unsatisfying, but I'm not going to try to make something up uh, to, to answer the question. Will there be an option for students to request which lunch they prefer? Uh, it's a good question. Um, we haven't done that in the past because we, uh, we, this year we tried to organize it by department because we want, uh, teachers have such short times and they, they don't get to see a lot of their colleagues in the first place. It's giving them an opportunity to visit um, with their colleagues during that time. Um, it also depends on where we're at in the building. I know previously, uh, prior to me coming here, they operated in phases, like different phases of the building, eight at different times. Really what we're trying to do is look at the total number of students that would be available during a certain time that our, that our cafeteria could allow. Uh, one of the issues that we, we transitioned to four lunches this year instead of three lunches was because we had students who were eating in the building and they were eating on the floor and eating in a variety of places in the academic building and it's not designed as a cafeteria. We have this beautiful cafeteria that is designed for students to eat in and so we had to add that fourth period in so that we could get all of our kids in there. And so we have to look at the numbers and we have to balance it and uh, the problem with that is that sometimes won't allow students to be able to choose which lunch they're going to be in. Another question is, Will the kids have to sign up for all eight blocks or, or can they have three blocks per day if they are on track for graduation? It's a great question. There, there's, there's some choice that is embedded in here. Um, you know, obviously we have some uh, non-graded courses. We have some community service learning type courses. Uh, we have study hall as an option. Uh, Again, I have to separate my role as, my, as, as being a parent of a high school student and also be, uh, from, from my role as being a principal. I've got my own philosophies and my own feelings about how to uh, schedule my own daughter for school, but I have to separate that because that's not my role with your child. My role with you and your child is to look at your child's entire picture and find out what's going to help them be the most successful. And so that may look different from one kid to the next. So, you know, I, I can't necessarily say that this would work because I don't know what situation your child is in. Now, they may be on track for graduate, uh, to graduate, but we've also had situations where we've had students who come down with mono all of a sudden and are out for six weeks. And if they don't have that credit built up, then that student is immediately behind. So, you know, we we'd want to have those conversations to kind of figure out, okay, is this really what is in the best interest? Is this really going to help them get to, uh, to the finish line of where they want to go? Another question is, will seniors who want a regular 12th grade full schedule be able to do this for the entire year or they'll be pushed into these other opportunities? That's the great thing about this schedule. If you want your child here all day, you can have your child here all day. We're just presenting opportunities that fit the, fit the different needs of our students. And so there's not a one size fits all model here. We really want to be able to personalize it and provide you choice in making educational decisions for your child. The C-Day is complicated for art. Example, prep and cleanup time for ceramics, at least 20 minutes. Uh, the C-Day would be difficult to enjoy this class. Uh, it's not just art. We also run into that issue with our science classes as well in terms of preparing for labs. And so uh, there's a lot of different ideas that are going around. I really like the brainstorming that our teachers are doing. Some teachers are looking at as an intervention day because they may have students who missed for a variety of reasons, maybe that C day is an opportunity to, to help catch them back up on work that they missed. That's one opportunity. You have others who are looking at saying, you know what, I'm going to uh, use this day to begin a new unit because just provide the introductory and then we can go into further depth. What 
I love about this is it allows our teachers the flexibility to decide how they're going to use that day. And so, you know, when you, when you go to that question, yes, inevitably, it's going to be difficult for some, but it's going to be great for others. If you talk to our choir and our band teachers, for example, choir and band teachers sometimes don't like the block schedule because that's too much time for them to be singing uh, using their voice. And so they might prefer a shorter period. So it's complicated for some. We just have to make some adjustments. Will you still be able to leave early if you take a zero hour class? The answer is yes. If you come to school at 715, your day will end, uh, I believe under this one is 220 is when the, the time frame worked out. With shortened class times, how will band practice work, especially during marching season? So uh, band always gets scheduled during the first part, the first block of each day with, uh, with in, in, in marching season. That doesn't change in this. And also you have the zero hour and then first and second under the schedule. So it's going on Friday, it might shorten it a little bit, but also on Friday, that's also when they're preparing for uh, either uh, marching at a football game or preparing for a competition. So it changes it a little bit. For the most part, though, they're still going to have their, their marching time. At what point do students get a break? This seems like a recipe for burnout student. If they have five AP classes on one day, considering a legacy of excellence you expect for them. You know what? It's a valid point. It's a valid point. But I'm, I'm also going to go back to... Uh, to the statement that I had made previously that it's not necessarily my job or my administrator's job or my teacher's job to say this is how, th this is the way that you should do it with your child. What it's our job is to help provide guidance. Is five AP classes a lot? Yeah, and I would expect our counselors and our teachers to have those conversations with you to say, hey, maybe we should consider this. But at the end of the day, if you and your child want to sign up for five AP classes because you can handle it, we need to be able to provide the opportunity for you to make that decision because some of our kids can handle it. Some can't. Some need to go get a job. Some don't. Some need more structure than others. And so we need to be able to provide a vehicle by which we can, we can allow that to happen. Has this new bill schedule been approved by the board? When will this be presented to students? Great question. So uh, the Board of Education has been notified of uh, and been kept up to speed regarding uh, the bell schedule. Uh, however, the Board of Education doesn't make that decision. That's, that's more of a site-based decision, but I can tell you that there has been a lot of conversation that has gone on between building level administration as well as central office administration to talk about the, the impact of that. Uh, I've been asked some very critical questions about how this is going to affect kids, how it's going to affect uh, the courses we offer, how it's going to affect our staffing. And again, that's all part of that vetting process. And so uh, it, it, won't be, it won't be approved by the board, uh, but Again, it, they, they are familiar and are aware and have had an opportunity to ask questions about that. In terms of letting our students know, I think our students through the grapevine have heard, but nothing formal has, has been presented to them. And I think that was also important to make sure that I uh, was able to present it to you first as parents so that you understood uh, what was going on. Uh, sometimes there is a disconnect. And again, I have a child who who attend school here but may not necessarily know everything that's going on. And so uh, I wanted you to be able to at least address potential rumors that are out there and say, well, no, we went to a presentation. This is actually what it is. So if your child comes home and says, man, they're getting rid of A&E, well, you know we're not getting rid of A&E. It's going to look a little bit different, but we're not getting rid of it. And so, you're, so that you're informed with the information with the facts, okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so without taking AP classes. Okay. So we also need to, uh, let, 
me back up a little bit. So there, there are some courses, whether they're AP or even some of our special service classes that are really only offered at one time during the day. And so if that conflicts with another course that they really like, then they're gonna have to make a choice. Now, uh, because your child receives special services through an IEP, we're going to map out what that schedule looks like, we'll develop a plan, and we'll, and we'll build that accordingly. Um, but more importantly, and it's not just for special education students, it's general education students as well, we want to make sure that we provide as many opportunities on the front end for them to find success so that when they get to that junior and senior year, they have a little bit more flexibility when they start figuring out, you know, I think I might want to take this pathway. And it also gets determined whether or not they need an extra year of high school because that's part of what their IEP is, that we've set them up for success beyond that four years. Does that answer your question? Yes. That's the question is what do you do with this? What do you do with this eighth period? What are you going to do with this extra time? That's the great thing about this. You're going to have a lot of choice. We've got a variety of different uh, elective courses that uh, that you could sign up for. You know, uh, we've got a robust career and technical education program that you know you can kind of dip your toe in to say, oh, I might want to try uh, health professions, or I might want to try business, or I might want to try computer science. You you have an opportunity to explore more of those opportunities, and or or you, you might say, you know what, this really is not something that I need, and uh, you know maybe I need some resource support because I have a child with special needs, and so I'm going to work with my IEP team to really figure out what's going to be best for for my child. The addition of that extra block in the day provides you one opportunities to explore but also sets you up down the road when you get to that junior and senior year for the flexibility component other questions yes yes No, so uh, the question was about lunch. And so I'm actually going to go back in that presentation so you can see this. So there are actually four different lunches. They're each 30 minutes long. So they, they are split in that, th um, like on an A day during third block. So we try to organize those in a fashion like, Science classes, which are lab heavy, or physical education classes where you're exercising, you would probably have the last lunch so that you can get through an entire academic period. But let's say you're in English, for example. You might go to lunch from 10.50 to 11.50, go to class, and then you have C lunch, so then you'll go to lunch, and after lunch is over, you'll go back to that class again and finish it out. So it totals, it totals the full 85 minutes. It's called a split lunch. So teachers, uh, our, our teachers right now have that split lunch. They just need to plan how that lesson is going to look so that, you know, maybe if they're giving a test one day, they're going to plan, uh, I'm going to give the test on the front end because I've got more time there, and then they're going to come for lunch, and then when they come back, we're going to start a new unit. So they, they build that in as part, of their, as part of their lesson planning. Great question. Yes. It's a good question. Uh, question was, because we have A&E on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, is that going to allow our clubs to meet more often? Uh, it's going to have to determine, on, it's going to have to be dependent on how we can build the, that club's schedule. I mean, ideally, you would like it to because you're increasing the number of spots up to at least three. Um, but yeah, we're going we're to have to look at that. Um, and try to figure out how that schedule is going to look, much like we figure it out now. But yeah, the hope would be that we would try to provide a little bit more opportunity. I don't know if it's going to be a ton, though. That's a great question, though. Other questions? Yes. That's a, gr that's a great question, and thank you for bringing that up. 
Um, because I've heard some of uh, the communication out there that we're taking courses away. Uh, I think it's important to note that our Department of Career and Technical Education at the state level is going through some significant changes, and so they are retiring courses, and they will be adding courses back in. This is kind of that lull year because we're getting ready for uh, scheduling courses, and unfortunately, some of the frameworks are not ready for these new courses to, to come on board. So we've got that one year where it, it's, gonna, it's gonna be tough. And unfortunately, if your child is a senior, they're missing out on some of those opportunities. But I've heard, I've heard uh, questions about going to like all virtual courses and, and no, I mean, we, we, are, we value career and technical education. It's just a really tough time. You know, coming as a product of a career and technical education teacher, my dad was a shop teacher for 35 years. I value it. And to see some of these opportunities go by the wayside and not necessarily have the immediate uh, impact and be available right away is really tough. But I'm also looking down the road that we are, we've got a bright future when it comes to career and technical education and expanding some opportunities. We just have to get through this, this rough year. And unfortunately, that wasn't any of our doing. It's just there's some, there's some major revisions going on at the state level. They should, in, in one way or another, we've got a course proposal process that we go through every single year. So, so some of those courses that may be retired uh, as new frameworks come on, we'll be able to go through the course proposal process and, and hopefully bring some of those back. But of course, you know, we have to look at a variety of different factors on whether or not they fit in within a program of study, uh, whether they're, uh, they meet industry uh, drive and growth. And so we, we have to do a variety of, of research when we, before we add those courses. But yes, the plan would be to look, do a holistic look at those programs and bring in courses that are going to fill out those programs of study. Yes? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Of course, I would get that from a student. So one of the things that uh, we had pointed out at the very beginning was we have board objectives on trying to uh, improve our schedule accuracy rate, but also reduce the number of schedule changes. And so one of the things that we have to do, and it's incumbent upon me as principal, is to make sure that we stress to you as parents and students the importance of the CAP process. Meaning that when you go to sign up for courses this year, that you're picking those courses that you really want to take, but then you also have to have a little bit of uh, foresight into you know, I might want to sign up for these as alternates in the event that I don't get these particular courses. And so signing up for as many alternates as you can so that when it comes time, you know what, I really don't think this is there, that you've got an alternate that you can fall back on. The difficulty in schedule changes, just because you asked it, is we are building our master schedule for next year. So I'm trying to coordinate where all my teachers are going to teach based off of numbers now. And then when those course changes come in and you have a lot of course change requests, well, I haven't planned for that. And then that means going to a teacher like Miss Simpkins and say, hey, I know you've already got 27 in your class. Can you take 28? And she's like, no, I can't because it's a lab. And so we're building off of those numbers. So we're gonna have to be able to teach all of our students to make sure that, listen, make alternate requests so that we can easy, uh, plug you in easier in course changes. It's a great question though. Other questions, yes? So the, que the question was, if uh, we're increasing the number of course offerings, does that mean that the class sizes will go down? Uh, so something you all need to know if you weren't familiar, State of Arkansas allows for 150 student cap, meaning that's how many contacts you can have with a child, like how many contacts you can have in a year. So uh, the reason why that's important is when we start looking at building our, our master schedule and putting uh, caps on, on courses, uh, we have to be cognizant of that 150 because we don't want our teachers to go over that number. So just by the very nature of our teachers teaching six classes per day, you could probably start at about a 25 
student cap, but understanding also that in some courses it might be 28, but others it might be 20. And so we just have to adjust. Science is a little bit difficult because you have lab safety issues and we need to make sure that we keep those uh, fairly, fairly small. But there is, there is a potential opportunity to lower some of the class sizes. But, the, sure. The, but the, the end goal is that 150, we can't, we can't exceed that ceiling. Good question. Other questions? Let me go back to this to make sure that there aren't any other questions that are up here. There weren't any others. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. So uh, on that, I'll minimize this so you can see it, so everybody can see it. You also have it on the handout. You'll notice that on the A's and B days, the lunches are back to back. And so under our current schedule, there's about a five minute buffer zone in between lunches where our kitchen staff or custodial staff can go around and clean up tables so that kids have somewhere uh, to eat. We feel really good about your, our A and B days under this schedule because there's always that transition from when kids are leaving the lunchroom to new kids coming down that we can clean up the cafeteria and, and get that going. C days do present a challenge when you look at that because you're, you're seeing like a, an eight minute overlap. And so what we have been doing this year, my administrative team, we're on lunch duty every single day and we're, we're watching. So even though we give high school students 30 minutes to eat their lunch. The reality of the situation is high school students are done eating in about 15 minutes. The, for the majority, they, they start down and spend 15 minutes just kind of talking. And so we just, just, just this anecdotal observational data. Then you also have students who just get up, especially when it's nice outside and will go out in the courtyard or hang under the breezeway. So it allows for a lot of things to get cleared out. Meanwhile, cafeteria uh, custodians and uh, kitchen workers as well as administrators are going around cleaning tables so that we can then cycle the next one, uh, next section through. So we feel good that we're gonna be able to accomplish it. Additionally, we're not also using the atrium areas on right outside of Bulldog Arena that we could potentially put tables there that would provide more seating. So we feel good about the transition and we think we can get it done. But we're gonna have to modify and adjust as we go. Well, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because we were also going through a custodial staff change during the time, and so we, we had one vendor and now we have this one. Uh, Mr. Ziegler, who is in the back of the room, works uh, directly with our custodial staff. He's been talking with them as, uh, about how this is going to look. With our kitchen staff, we have also visited with them in terms of the turnover in terms of how they can prepare that kitchen, are you gonna have that mad rush of people and they feel like they can get that taken care of? Other questions? Yes. So, uh, Yes, this is being used at other schools. Um, what I can tell you is that when you look at just the AB, the AB portions, there are AB uh, schedules all across the country. Um, there are also four by four block schedules across the country. Uh, we've seen a few of these. Uh, I think the closest one uh, to us would be Bentonville. Bentonville has a very similar schedule to this and it works effectively for them. Um, when I engage in conversations about bell schedules, uh, obviously I get really fired up because that's like where my passion is. And I think one of the things that we need to talk about when it comes to bell schedules is the impact that it has on your culture. It's, the bell schedule is a cultural thing. There's a lot of research out there that will say that it doesn't improve student achievement or it does improve student achievement. 
I mean, we could, we could argue either way on that. What it, really, what it really has an impact on is the culture. The other thing that we know about block schedules in particular, like this, and Friday is going to be presenting a challenge for us, is block schedules, you actually see a decrease in student behavior issues because there's less transitional time. There's less passing periods on block schedules. But you notice then on Friday, there's going to be a lot of passing periods from one class to the other. And so as an administrative team, as school staff, we're gonna have to really monitor that to make sure that we've got the appropriate things in place to make sure that we can minimize that as much as possible. And anytime you're talking about a 550,000 square foot campus, you know, you've, you're gonna have to do a lot of modifying and tweaking because we know that it's not gonna be perfect. But to go back to your original question, yes, other schools are doing it and they are seeing success with it. Well, a, when, I, when I talk about culture, it's some of the questions that, uh, that came up tonight. Um, you know, there are, uh, there are folks who grew up in uh, an educational environment where they had a traditional schedule. And so in their mind, the traditional seven period or eight period day schedule, that's the only way that you should be conducting a high school sequence. There's also that culture of, you know what, I'm really focused in on going deep into curriculum rather than trying to cover a wide curriculum. So block schedules are known to be able to provide more depth in terms of uh, going deeper into discussion as opposed to covering a, a whole lot more curriculum. Typically block schedules don't cover as much curriculum as say a uh, traditional schedule. And so there's, there's a cultural component of what your community values and based, again, we're operating off of the data that we received from parents, from students, that the culture supports keeping a block schedule as opposed to a traditional schedule. Does that answer your question? And so, you no, know, I, it's a valid question, and part of the discussion that we had with uh, the Bell Schedule Committee was we looked at actually just doing continuing the AB schedule without the C day, because but just having that extra block in there. But then that was creating some of the issues of I get to see my kids three times a week versus I get to see my kids two times a week. And so the committee said we really like the fact that we are going to get to see our kids three times a week consistently. Other questions? I'll practice my wait time as a teacher. I will stick around here for a little bit. Uh, if you have specific questions that you want to, to, talk, to talk with me about, I'd be uh, happy to answer those for you. Um, but the bigger thing is I just wanted to make sure that you knew I appreciate you coming out uh, and sitting through the presentation. I know at this time of year with the holiday season that uh, schedules are tight, uh, but I, I appreciate the fact that you took the time to come in and, and learn more about this. And I would also hope that uh, if you have questions, if you have feedback or anything like that, you can always reach me by, by email. Uh, I think that those of you in the room who have emailed me before know that I'm gonna get back to you uh, in pretty short order. So if you have specific questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I'd be happy to, happy to answer them. Um, but again, I'll also stick around and answer questions for you, uh, if you if you wanna come up and visit with me. So thank you again. I hope you have a, a wonderful evening and a wonderful holiday.